Well, it's already three o'clock. I want to thank everyone for joining us. I have on the screen the um, and Justice for All Civil Rights poster to share. And I want to show the Spanish version and um, to share that Purdue University is equal, equal civil. We want to follow civil rights, obviously. And I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to let Anna Catherine share. And while you're getting ready to share, I'm going to introduce you. I want to thank everyone for joining us for our first SARE Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion talk. And Tamara Benjamin, Dr. Tamara Benjamin organized most of it, but I'm thankful that everyone could join us today. And this will is being recorded so that we can have it for later. Thank you for letting us record this, Dr. Mansfield. So let me introduce Dr. Mansfield. I'm Anna Catherine from Cornell. Anna Catherine Mansfield is the Associate Director of Cornell Agritech at the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station in Geneva, New York. Since August 2020, she has led Cornell Agritech's diversity, equity, and inclusion effort, which aims to enhance the diversity of student, staff, and faculty within the institution, while also expanding stakeholder reach and extension accessibility to underserved communities in New York State and beyond. Mansfield holds a BA in English from Salem College, graduate degrees in food science from Virginia Tech and the University of Minnesota, and a certificate in theological education from the University of the South. Anyway, yes, thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Um, I am here today to talk about equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion, ag extensions, trouble past, and hopeful future. Um, I am currently the associate director of Cornell Agritech. Um, I use she, her pronouns, um, and I come from an extension background. I've been an enologist since 1996 and in extension for enology since 2001. My research background is in wine flavor chemistry and sensory science. So I spent some time thinking about communication, science communication, um, but uh, not specifically in DEI. Uh, I was a little cautious about this invitation because I'm not a DEI professional. I'm sure some of you have much more training than I do. Um, but um, I'm hoping that um, I can sort of tell you how I got here and the ways I've been thinking about things. Um, I was supposed to take a sabbatical in fall 2020 where I was going to go study sparkling wine in Europe, but uh, instead had a stabatical. Um, and so the pandemic induced isolation had me thinking a lot about bigger issues like the pronounced racial inequalities evident in our society, uh, the public's growing distrust of science, and the increasing challenges that farmers face in our changing climate. And then at about the same time, the George Floyd murder prompted our director, Jan Nyrup, to really speed up our, our kind of slow rolling DEI planning. So I was asked to start a cross-cutting DEI committee in August 2020. And over the this last summer, I converted it to an integrated DEI council. And we can talk about the difference of those two later, if you'd like, in September of 2021. So we've just been doing that for about a month. So I'm definitely drinking from a fire hose, um, but I hope I can kind of Share, you my, share with you my thoughts about how extension values help me understand DEI and why DEI in some ways is really just a faucet of extension. Um, in case you are unfamiliar with Cornell Agritech, um, you can see our campus here on the left. We currently have about 850 acres. We are an agricultural experiment station about an hour northwest of Maine Cornell campus. We have four academic departments horticulture, plant pathology, entomology, and food science. And all of our faculty have extension appointments. We also house an integrated pest management unit and a USDA ARS unit, in addition to our field research crew and, and other service um, business units, that sort of thing. Um, the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station, or NYS AES, was established in 1880. It became a part of Cornell in 1923. We changed our name to Cornell Agritech in 2018, uh, at least in part because we were tired of people calling us nice ass. And we work primarily on fruit, vegetable, fiber, and biofuel crops and craft beverages, which is my favorite. We've got about 300 people, including faculty, staff, and grad students. We don't have any undergraduate students. So that's our community. That's enough about me, but to introduce what I'd like to talk about today, um, I would love um, to know, uh, you can put it in chat or, or raise your hand. I would love to know if this is familiar to any of you at Purdue. 
I see some yeses. That's great. Yeah, so this is, it seems to be your land acknowledgement I found online. We acknowledge the traditional homelands of the indigenous peoples which Purdue University is built upon. We honor and appreciate the Bodawami, Lenape, Mia Mia, and Shawnee peoples who are the original indigenous caretakers. Um, and um, I, I'm, we're also going to post an article in chat. This is a, a you know a, an indigenous land acknowledgement um, statement, and we're seeing more and more of these, especially in land grant universities. But there there's some pros and cons to doing this, but it's something interesting to think about. So um, it is a nice segue into a brief history of land grants, which we are all a part of. Um, the Morrill Land Grant Act came about in 1862, and it was a federal statute providing for the creation of a college in each state to teach such branches of learning as are related to agriculture and the mechanic arts in order to promote the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes. It just struck me that liberal is sitting right there in that description, which is interesting. But um, this was a time, you must realize, when most colleges were teaching classical studies, if you think of Yale or various institutions that were founded by religious groups. And to get into any of those kinds of colleges, preparatory education, which was quite expensive, was needed. Most members of the working class were excluded. Uh, you had to have um, proficiency in classical languages for existence. And it didn't really teach these practical skills. So leading up to the Civil War, there was a recognized national need for agriculture and engineering education for what they called in the common man and of course it was just men at the time and interestingly enough the deciding factor as we led up to the civil war was the fact that all of these land-grant universities were required to have um, ROTC so that's why we have, we've got ROTC units at all of our land grants um, Cornell is the only is the only Ivy that has a ROTC it's an interesting conundrum. Um, but the result was that we had all of these new institutions established at once, but that they were really badly funded. So after the Civil War, when things were back on a more even footing, um, a second Morrill Act was passed to create means to generate funding. They provided annual appropriations to each state to support their colleges, and primarily uh, in a provision aimed at the former Confederate states, they required proof that race was not a factor in admissions or, or the creation of separate colleges for persons of color. And you can guess which choice was made in most of these southern states. So this uh, resulted in the creation of many of the HBCUs, the historically black colleges and universities that we know of. So if we back up just a minute to the first Morrill Act and we look at a map of the United States from right around the time of the Civil War, um, you can see, and we know historically, that a lot of the land east of the Mississippi and even one state west of the Mississippi had pretty much been parceled out. So the question that we like to forget about or not think about in our modern land grant conversation, you know, the high and lofty goals we have in our land grants, um, is where did the federal government get the land that it was granting to start these wonderful universities for the common man? And of course, the answer is that it came from native tribes that were being displaced often violently. And um, I believe um, the link to the High Country News report from, from 2019, uh, for which they did two years of research, tracking down uh, about 95% of all of the land parcels that were used to start these land grant universities. Um, they reported on all 11 million acres which came from 160 treaties and sessions, uh, many treaties that we did not uh, honor, by the way, and um, took land from about 250 tribes and bands and maybe more that we, we don't know of. Um, so one common perception, even if you know that land grant came from um, repossessed lands, people are unsure or, or don't realize that it's not just the land that you're sitting on, it's not just your campus. Um, but land was, parcels of land across the West were given to universities to help, um, to manage as they wish, to help fund their institution. So if you go to the Land Grab U um, High Country News site, you can actually work with their interactive map. And you can see here for Purdue, I mean, you've got uh, initially had land from several surrounding states and as far west as Montana and California. Um, and I point this out not to say, um, not to, to, to you know speak from a point of um, 
of high ground because Cornell was the worst offender. We got more total acreage, I believe, than anyone else. And Ezra Cornell was an incredibly good manager, so he raised a lot of money from the land that we had. So it is fair to say that Cornell was founded on indigenous genocide. Um, and um, we need to acknowledge that. For me personally, it is even more poignant because the land that Cornell Agritech is sitting on was exactly the site of um, Kananda Saga, which was kind of the capital um, in our terms of the Haudenosaunee or Seneca peoples. And leading up to the Revolutionary War, um, General George Washington ordered General Sullivan to drive out the residents, destroy all their food stores, burn all their buildings, cut down their orchards. It was like a complete scorched earth campaign that resulted in a trail of tears towards Buffalo and English allies in um, Canada and the near extinction of the Haudenosaunee. If you know anything about the Seneca Nation, it is now scattered over about um, six different uh, um, land holdings in the U.S. and in Canada and is very fragmented at this point. So um, in um, our farming here, I know at least one burial was accidentally disturbed in the 80s uh, and we are fairly certain there are others that we just hope we do not run into. So it's, it's still kind of an uncomfortable place um, when you think of it that way. So we kind of, the U.S. kind of did something to, uh, to take the edge off that, <laughs> kind of. Uh, in the Equity and Education Land Grant Status Act in 1994, land grant status was provided to select American Indian colleges and institutions, and this also established an endowment fund and capacity building grants for those institutions. This is something I didn't even know about until I started doing sort of the reading to understand where land grants came from. But this brings us up today. This is a, a almost current map. I believe it's only a few years old. So you can see if you look for the red dots, those are our 1862 land grant institutions. There's one in almost every state. And then the white stars, which are primarily in the south, are those 1890s that are either HBCUs or in the case of West Virginia, it hadn't been a state prior to the Civil War, so that became West Virginia State University. And then the 1994s, the, the blue squares are primarily west and north. Um, and that's sort of the layout of our land grant today. So that said, now that we've come up to the present with land grant history, now I'm gonna roll us back again and let's talk about the history of extension. It was instituted by the Smith-Lever Act in 1914 and it provided for cooperative extension service in land-grant institutions. The thought was that work funded by the public, as all of these universities theoretically still were and theoretically still are, should be made available free to the public. It's been a USDA academic partnership and the goal originally was to educate rural Americans about advances in agricultural practices and in technology. So quite similar to the land grant mission itself. And from the beginning, as you can easily deduce if you look at these pictures, normative culture and extension has been white and male, not to mention cisgender and heterosexual. In other words, we operate within a culture that consciously or unconsciously has supported ideas and practices that make being white, male, and cishet, if you're unfamiliar with that word, it's just cisgendered and heterosexual, the natural state or baseline. Whereas everything else is different. We talk about the female extension agent or the um, the black extension person, that so on and so forth. Um, this isn't a value judgment. It's expected. Um, if you have done any DEI work at all, you know that um, institutions of any longevity in the United States tend to have a normative white male culture because they were created for and by white males. And that includes all of our universities, right? And extension. So this isn't a shame, shame. This is a, a, a fact or a, a chance to look at where we started what our norm has been and ways in which we consciously or unconsciously perpetuate that norm. So we know where we start when we want to reach out to other groups. Um, I do want to include some caveats. Um, it wasn't all male. Um, in the progressive era in the early 1900s, we also saw the first significant groups of women getting 
advanced degrees, uh, and there weren't a lot of jobs for these quote unquote overeducated women. Um, so many of them ended up in extension work. They primarily were educating rural and farm women on cutting edge science-based homemaking skills, nutrition, home economics, child rearing. Um, they got deep into the chemistry of cleaning, the chemistry of food, yay, food science, um, clothing design and home decorating. And if you're interested in that kind of thing, there are just fabulous extension bulletins from you know the, the teens and 20s where they talk about the scientific principles of of fashion and the scientific principles of home decorating and it's there's really a lot of, of, of good of good scientific principles were applied to things that that seem mildly esoteric today but um, that was where they could use their talents so that's where they did also especially in the south there were segregated agencies um, that offered home demonstration clubs which were, again, the women's work, um, and 4-H to black rural populations. So they were still primarily white, but often sometimes black extension um, personnel who were working with the black communities in the southern states. Um, it's unclear how much segregation occurred in northern states. It really varies by location. So all of that said, again, bringing us up to the present. In cooperative extension, we translate science for practical application we identify emerging research needs and encourage application of science-based answers to improve agricultural, economic, and social conditions. And we prepare people to break the poverty, the cycle of poverty, excuse me, encourage healthful lifestyles, and prepare youth for responsible adulthood. And it certainly has moved beyond just farming, 4-H. Um, nutrition programs are, are good examples of that. But I want to focus today on ag extension and the challenges that we face um, within that realm. So I'd like to take a minute first to compare sort of these, these goals, this mission of cooperative extension with the way we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And definitions are important here. Um, in diversity, we know that multiple identities are represented. Um, that just means folks are there, not that they're necessarily included, but we certainly value diversity in the scientific community. I mean, it's international, it's interdisciplinary, and we know that great advances are made when we exchange ideas across disciplines or across you know, country lines or across labs even. Equity is the fair treatment of all people to ensure their full participation and advancement within a system. And that's something that we have always said we wanted to do with extension. We strive to provide accessible and evidence-based information to all comers, right? We don't always go out and look for those people, but we strive to provide the, the information. And inclusion means that the thoughts and ideas and perspectives of all individuals matter. I think most extension personnel will tell you that extension is not a one-way street, that they are learning as much from their stakeholders as their stakeholders learn from them. I know that's certainly true in my field. It's a collaborative learning environment. That hasn't always been the case, but it is certainly something that we see now. And if done correctly, this work in diversity, equity, and inclusion creates a sense of belonging, where we engage the full potential of each individual, where innovation thrives, and where views, beliefs, and values are integrated. Um, traditionally, We've been pretty top down, right? If you think of the beginning of ag extension, the experts who were scientists provided the information and it was kind of up to the stakeholders to seek it out. Um, we haven't always gone looking to see who we're missing. And that's a point I want to make a little bit later. But let's look at who, if we look at farmers in general, let's look at who our audience is. It is 95% white as of 2017, 56% male. And average age is 57.5, so we are still looking at slightly over majority male and largely white. It has changed a little bit in the past few years. We have in the past, um, I believe the past since 2015, seen a 27% increase in female farmers. And while when we say, you know, it's primarily male, they're often family farms. But in this case, the female farmers would be where um, a, a woman is identified as the lead or the owner of the farm a 13% increase in Latinx farmers, and there are smaller and more diverse operations. It's also notable that black farm ownership has increased 90% um, since 1910 when we started paying attention. Um, 
since 1910, white farmers have lost 2%. So it's not that we've lost a lot of white folks, it's that we are actually getting um, more diversity uh, otherwise. So the questions that we need to ask when we realize this is sort of our average, currently our average stakeholder makeup is, is who are we missing? And I think there's sort of four main categories of potential stakeholders that we aren't seeing. Um, the first is those industry members who feel like they aren't in the club. Um, I've heard this language used around here, like the people who are in the club know to come and ask for the information, but other folks just don't know that. So they're, they're, they're outsiders in some way or other. Um, there are also industry beginners who aren't aware that extension exists or even what it does. And I think there are more of those than we perhaps know. Um, legacy farmers grew up in a relationship with extension. Newcomers, people who have moved to the area who were doing something else and are now farming, don't. So that's a big area of, of um, individuals who may not, we may not be seeing. Um, increasingly non-native English speakers and others with different modes of communication. We need to find out who they are and um, look at our immigrant populations and see if they are farming as well. And finally, um, not because they don't know we exist, but there are groups that traditionally have been mistreated or ignored by state and federal institutions. We've talked a lot about already, you know, in the introduction to land grant institutions about um, our Native American populations. But we also, if you've been following the news recently, know that USDA has a, a history of not um, giving loans to small black farmers at nearly the same rate they give to small white farmers. And that has, has is lower now than it has been in quite a while. So that is a concern and is a population that we perhaps aren't helping as much as we can. Now the question that I get a lot or the pushback that I get a lot is, all right, well, if we're doing all of this and we're trying to look for these populations that are underrepresented, who might we alienate? And we have had a small number of our traditional stakeholders who are not up for it. Um, we had a farmer who was a, a big donor to our organization who said that this was liberal PC bullshit. They weren't having any of it. DEI is politicized um, and they they withdrew their uh, their financial support. Um, our dean was, I think, did absolutely the right thing and said, that's okay. <laughs> These are our values. Um, we are not exclusionary, and so if you feel like the people we are including are not the people you want to be working with, then we're sorry, but this is the direction that we want to go. Uh, that doesn't always happen, and it is something that you have to think about, but I think it is the right direction. If we adhere to our values, which is include everyone, um, you have some good, some good arguments against saying this is, you know, PC BS. Um, Another question that I have and I don't have a good answer for, but we can think about because that might help us change, is why are we so far behind? 4-H and other extension programs I mentioned, um, nutrition assistance, have fantastic DEI components and they have for years. I have learned so much just reading the 4-H pages about DEI. Um, National Extension, the National Extension Organization has got a DEI component, but it hasn't always filtered down. So the next question that I ask myself, and based on all this, we know where we are now with both land grant and with extension, and we know we're missing people. How can we improve? And the first way always with DEI is to improve your culture within your organization. Before you can reach out, you have to assess where you are and whose voices are included. Um, culture is defined as a system of inherited values goals and language that provides members with shared identity and purpose. And we, we draw a lot of that in our extension communities from our extension values. It's science-based, it's you know evidence-based, it's providing help um, to anyone who needs the help that we can provide. It's, it's um, making expertise accessible. Uh, and here I use organization broadly. It can be your university, it can be your department, it can be your program, it can be your lab. Um, so you can think about where the culture is relevant in the ways that you interact with with your constituents. Um, who's there? Who's missing? An important question is what are the unwritten rules? What are things that a newcomer or somebody coming into your culture doesn't know but just never happens or always happens? Um, and sometimes you have to have a consultant to do this. Like those of you who are fish can't see the water. Uh, somebody coming from outside can, can see what that, that norm is. And again we probably are all starting with 
you know, white, heterosexual, male norms. Um, just again, as an illustration, we last fall, so about a year ago now, we performed a survey, a demographic survey, and also some questions about belonging and who felt like they had been um, discriminated against in various ways at Cornell Agritech. And you can see this is the demographic makeup of our respondents, and it's primarily white, right? Major big time white. So if it's also predominantly male, by the way. Um, <laughs> so we, we fit the, the stereotype. So when we ask as a whole and just average all the numbers and said, are we going doing good DEI work? Do you feel like we belong? Are, is our programming appropriate? Is everything okay? Um, the, the average response was, yeah, it's all great. We're, we're doing wonderfully. I feel fine here. But when we disaggregated that data and took out that majority of white people and asked everyone else if things were okay, um, they said, it wasn't that they didn't always feel like they could bring their whole self to work. They felt like people talked about them um, in disrespectful ways, all kinds of things that we needed to get to the bottom of. And that's another thing we don't like to do as scientists, right? As scientists, we're like, this is the this is the data. These little data points aren't big enough to matter in the whole. On the whole, we're doing well. But when we're talking about DEI, um, we need to amplify sometimes the voices of the, the minority because they're the ones who aren't feeling comfortable. And that's what's important if we ever want these numbers to be better. Um, so again, just as a, a visual example, you know, this is a, a picture from the University of Minnesota uh, extension um, in 1945, the white guy out in the cornfield, compared to our Cornell Food Venture Center, which is um, a small food production entrepreneur center that we, we run in food science here, um, where we have mostly women. Um, I think we have at least three languages spoken fluently within this group, uh, and they use all three of them with our audiences, and at least two of these individuals were not born in the US. So we are seeing greater diversity um, within our culture, but I mean, this is still a lot of white people, right? So there's a lot of work to be done, and we have to know where we are before we can do anything else. Does your organization mirror your stakeholder audience? Which leads to the next question. We need to critically assess our existing and our potential audiences. It isn't just a bunch of white men with, may I say, incredibly cool hats. Uh, it is much more diverse now. But we don't always know who we're missing. And that's the question I get the most. Like, how do I figure out who's not showing up, and how do I find them? And the simple answer is compare census numbers to the known stakeholders in your program, right? But that doesn't always work. You really have to be creative. Um, I know people who have crowdsourced it, like gone to their stakeholder base and said, okay, who are we missing? Who do you know is out here farming that I don't see? It feels like racial profiling, but if you have a person of color who is farming, you can ask them, who in your community isn't showing up? Who am I missing? Um, reach out to affinity groups, the NAACP, um, there's Black Farmers of America. There are ways to find this information. And it is more work than just opening the door and see who shows up, right? It, it is going out and searching, but I think that's appropriate. Other ways that we can, prove, can improve is to develop cultural literacy. I mean, we're still swimming in this water of, it's a top-down science-first hierarchy. And that even if that is technically right, that isn't always the best way to convey the information. Um, we don't have to start with, the science says this, so do this. We can start with, what is the history and tradition of your culture? Oh, interesting. The thing that you've always done traditionally has scientific backing, so we can improve it and tweak it in this way. That's still within the realm of what's comfortable in your tradition, um, and isn't me just applying science or making you do science. Um, there are studies that suggest that heavy reliance on research often excludes um, black, indigenous, and people of color who don't always trust research for very good reasons, like, oh, you know, the Tekka CG syphilis study. Um, and one example that I have found really resonant is that there was an instance where proposed studies didn't consider the fact that certain trees within the, the, the land that was being studied were considered sacred to the indigenous people who lived there. And they had to sort of talk to those groups and think more about how they were going to do this study to um, not, to, to still get the information to the, the community that was living there in ways that did not um, uh, interfere with their beliefs. Uh, and that was absolutely doable. 
other ways we can improve, we need to think about our communication options. Um, in white normative culture, we really value the written word. If it's written down, especially on official letterhead, it is true. I struggle with this because I am a writer at heart and I am a reader at heart. And yeah, I find my information mostly through reading, but not all cultures do that. And in-person communication can be really powerful. Um, also think about your translation. We are at a point now with our food safety where we are translating um, at least 50%, maybe 60 now into Spanish because that is what our audience needs. Um, and also, as you can see here on the right, like accessibility, um, disability or persons with disabilities are also part of our diversity and accessibility is the key here. We can show the subtitles. That's what we are doing actually now on this talk. And it's not perfect transcription, but it's better than nothing. So <laughs> we're, we've got to start there. We need to improve, but always think about folks in your, um, your audience who perhaps um, could benefit from having a subtitle and it's not always just people who are uh, in the deaf community sometimes it's folks who um, just learn better reading so another thing to think about a really interesting way that we can improve is to diversify the way that we do data collection it isn't just about lab work or lab trained technicians going out and taking the data um, I have a colleague, Judson Reed, who has been doing some really great participatory research with the Mennonite community around here. Um, he graciously let me use that picture on the right, which is a picture of one of the community members. Um, traditionally in our Mennonite communities in New York, um, no one gets more than an eighth grade education. So this is um, a young woman who works on her family farm who again, does not have a master's or even a BA in anything scientific, but certainly understands the system and is on the farm. And so Judson worked with her and with several other members of the community to train them on how to take data um, and do the reporting on some on-farm selections, or excuse me, on-farm experiments. Um, and this was a part of a framework where the Mennonite community and the scientists worked together to define the goals of the project, to design the project, to talk about implementation, who could do this data collection uh, and why, and then to also evaluate the program. And it's been really effective um, for both research questions and extension questions. It's an approach that's more common in developmental sociology, but I see a lot of promise in using that in some of our field work and extension as well. Another way, it sounds really simple, um, although those of you who have large swaths of land to cover, geographic area to cover in your extension programming is really just to show up. Being there, um, boots on the ground, and being face to face with uh, potential stakeholders who perhaps feel like they have been ignored or have been underserved goes a long way in showing that you're willing to make the effort. Even if you don't speak their language, showing up and making that assessment so that next time you can arrange for a translator is is huge. And this is my bet noir because there are two of us responsible for 460 wineries across our state, which is not small. It's seven hours end to end. So this isn't always feasible, but we're starting to think about ways that we can do this better. Um, and it certainly, again, can be done with community liaisons. A big thing that is more systemic um, that we need to talk to our supervisors about is what our metrics are. And again, just as an example, this was from Food Science um, Agritech's um, annual report in 2019. And you can see that our sole way of reporting what we had done in extension was the number of hours of training we delivered, which doesn't tell us who we were training, if that training did any good, if anybody implemented that training. Um, so we need to think more about how we measure success. Is it really just contact hours? I know that's what we have to report, you know, when we do our, our annual reporting. But what about quality of life measures? And the thought or the, the theory of radical accountability would urge us to ask our underrepresented ask the one black farmer that you work at work with if you're meeting their needs go and seek out the um the underrepresented populations and say 
are you getting what you need from us? And, and if not, why not? Um, and some qualitative, in addition to quantitative reporting, may be in order. Um, but sort of to, to wrap up so that we have time for questions, um, there's some things that, that I believe are really true about Extension, and I hope we all do. It's that Extension is local, and it's a relationship. Um, it's not transactional. But we have to be intentional about it. Again, just saying we want to be inclusive is not enough. We've got to actively both assess the culture within our programs, assess, assess the, the stakeholders that we are meeting, see who we're missing, and find ways to reach out um, and perhaps figure out some cultural competencies along the way, which we may not know that we are missing. So some humility is, is in order as well. Um, I would also like to, to challenge you to think about the fact that in DEI, um, we talk about shifting from allyship to accomplice status. And I think we could, we could say that this is something that we've done over the last hundred years in extension too, right? We sort of started out in some ways with the savior mentality here in the, in the orange circle where the, the, the knowledgeable scientist goes out to save the farmer from his unscientific ways. Um, and we moved now, I feel like, to we're more at a place of allyship where we are offering support, we're saying doors open, we're, we're willing to give you whatever you need, just come to us. But we need to move to being an accomplice where we use the power that we have as scientists, as extension educators, to advocate for these groups that are perhaps not getting the attention or the support that they need and to actually use the data that we collect because we probably often have a broader overall view of what's happening in our fields than an individual farmer would or legislators that we work with and and talk about the impact that diversity has on systems um, and and stand up for that um, one question we often get here at Cornell is all right if I make a statement um, that sounds like I am chiding someone for not being inclusive is you know, is the hierarchy going to back me up on that? And our answer has been yes, absolutely, um, because we are not exclusionary here. We want to include everyone. And so again, if you meet that, the person who doesn't like the liberal BS, um, we have a response to that. And it's that we include everyone and we advocate for everyone. For instance, what if we don't uh, just actively seek out underrepresented stakeholders, but actively work to build farmer to farmer learning events? and that would strengthen a diverse network within a field. That's an exciting concept to me. So I just want to end by showing you some of the places where I have found um, inspiration and information. Um, if you look up here, um, deiextension.org um, has some great information um, from the Extension Foundation Impact Collaborative. 4-H, as I mentioned, has got really great information. I do no 4-H at all, but I've learned a lot just from some of the things they've done over the years. And um, if you are a podcast listener, the podcast Seen on Radio had a series a couple years ago called Seeing White that actually includes some of this land-grant information and helped me really understand um, the systemic racism that um, pervades agriculture as well as other parts of our society. So it's incredibly helpful. And again, special thanks to my colleague Judson Reed, um, who has been working with um, lots of diverse groups and has been doing really creative things. He has a great picture of himself giving a talk um, with three different translators, um, translating to three different languages in a small farming project that he has going on um, in Buffalo. Uh, that just really struck me too. The, the fact that he would go through that much work and arrange that kind of um, interaction, which was really helpful for everyone there, was, was really great. So um, I can leave this up if you all would like um, and answer questions from chat, or if you want me to, um, I can stop sharing so that we can all see each other's faces and go from there. I hope that people can um, show their faces. I don't know what my settings are on Zoom. Okay. But I'll stop sharing. Oh, thank you. Go ahead and please ask questions. Um, 
of Anna Catherine. She's going to get to be with us till four. If you ask questions in chat, I kind of lost it before uh, Ashley because my computers got stuck. But I have a question before that, Anna Catherine, if you could see it or someone could share with us. Sure. Yeah. Let me scroll back up. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. Um, I don't see a question. Sorry. Okay, just checking. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Anna Catherine? And if you need help unmuting yourself, um, let me know. Thanks, Skylar, for the cisgender explanation. This is Amy. Let me turn on my camera. Hi. Um, I wondered, um, you know, the self-assessment of your, or the assessment of your organization. Did, when you were going through that process, I wondered if there was um, much resistance to it and statements like, we've already done this, and, and how you overcame that if you did encounter that. Absolutely. Interestingly enough, so Cornell every three years is something that they call, um, yes, I can share these slides, that they call belonging at Cornell, which is the whole organization. And from the very beginning, we were concerned about that because, because we have these four academic units in our separate campus, um, we weren't sure we were going to get breakout data, and we absolutely did not. So <laughs> there was no way for us to see what was happening at our, our campus of 300 people. Uh, and I think, so, well, let me back up. So then we went to um, the powers that be and said, hey, we didn't get good breakout data. We would really like to ask more specific questions. And they said, no, nope, survey fatigue. We really don't want you to do this. And we ultimately, you know, we went back and forth, and they ultimately said, okay, we don't want you to do this, but we can't tell you not to. So we did it. Um, mostly because um, our Jan Nairab, my director, said we really need this information if we're going to do anything with it. And because the belonging at Cornell data, again, Cornell as a whole is primarily white. So we were mostly saying, yeah, everything's fine. We're doing great. When we knew from talking to non-white populations, and I use non-white, not, we often don't want to use non-white because it suggests that white is the norm. But in this case, that was how we could break out the data. We could take the white people out of the responses. Um, we knew from other folks that that was not, it was not the case, that there were problems. Um, so we um, pulled from, I believe there's the, uh, there's a survey, if you email me I can send it to you, there's a survey by um, a private colleges association that asked really specific questions like, have you ever felt that you were treated differently because you were a woman because of your religious beliefs, because of whatever. And we use some of those also to ask basic demographics and explain to our population, you know, belonging at Cornell doesn't tell us anything about what's happening here. Please help us. And so we had, gosh, I think we had 250 responses and we sent out 300. Or maybe we spent out 250 and we had 9, 9, 195 responses. So we got pretty good response rate and very little pushback. Um, the only, the biggest pushback I got was folks who, emailed me privately and said, I really, because I am the only woman in my department, I really don't want to state that I, you know, I don't want to answer any questions about being a man or a woman because I'm afraid that then I'll be singled out. And because of the way we set it up, we, and aggregated results, that wasn't a concern, but we had to talk some folks through that. So I think it's telling it and explaining why it's helpful and how you're gonna use the data and um, being very clear about the way you ask demographics. Another thing that we did that I think helped was instead of asking for responses from students and postdocs and extension faculty and tenure track faculty and so on, we decided on three broad groups, faculty, staff, and students and we asked postdocs to join in with the students and I think also visiting scientists so that we never had a response group that was so small that we knew who they were. So that didn't give us as specific data in some instances but I think overall it helped us to get more accurate data. That was kind of long-winded. I hope that answers your question, Amy. Amy gave a thumbs up. Yay. 
Anybody else have any questions? Anna Catherine, I appreciated your um, presentation today. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, as a Cornellian, I've struggled with everything that's gone on over the past couple of years since the land grab report came out. Um, I'm a proud Cornellian, and on the same token, I went to three different land grant universities, and all of them benefited from the land grab. Cornell arguably has done more than any of the others and probably had to, given the amount of land that um, we acquisitioned. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, what has gone on at Cornell? Because there's been no discussion of this at Purdue, at least one that I've been aware of. We haven't discussed it at all. I put in a blog that was shared yesterday during the national land grab uh, seminar that was hosted by o Ohio State <laughs> University. Can you talk a little bit about what's been going on on campus and, and the efforts that are being made there? And then I guess the one thing I'll throw out here, and we can debate this all day long, but um, <laughs> I think you I think you would benefit from learning more about the JSEP organizations in terms of extensions. We lifted up 4-H. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other organizations that fall under the Joint Council of Extension Professionals, including the National Association of Community Development Extension Professionals and all the NACAA and all the alphabet soup that comes along with being an extension. And um, I hesitate to lift up 4-H as necessarily as necessarily necessarily the national standard in terms of diversity work. They still have a lot of challenges that they're dealing with with the LGBTQ community as well as others. Okay. Thank and you. If you've been to national headquarters, you'll see that um, uh, some of it's performative, I would argue. I think they still have a long way to go. I appreciate the organization. They do fantastic work. We've made great strides here in Indiana through our SPARK programs to try to diversify it. We've got several folks on staff that are crushing it, but we still have a really long way to go. So I, I invite you to learn more about the other extension organizations that are out there. We have a long way to go with NACDEP. We just started our first DEI committee. We've never had one before. And as a former president, I'm embarrassed of that. I'm glad that we're doing good work now. So I guess, I'll turn it back to Cornell, and if you could tell us all the things that are going on there to try to deal with the land grab report. Sure, thank you. And if you have a second, I, I am unfamiliar with some of the organizations that you mentioned, so if you put those in the chat, that would be really helpful to me. And I apologize for my ignorance. Like I said, I am learning as fast as I can um, and definitely don't know it all, So, um, but I'm definitely willing to learn more. <laughs> um, Yes, so Cornell has got a very active American Indian and Indigenous Studies program. Um, I honestly um, am not going to, because I am at a different campus from them and haven't only interacted them, with them specifically for what's happening on our campus in the Kananda Saga and Seneca um, relations, I am not going to be the best person to outline all of the things that they have done. But one of the things that they have done early on um, because of our physical difference, um, Cornell proper, the campus is actually on Cayuga land, so a different nation than, than where I am. They have been working with, for several years with the Cayuga Nation uh, in terms of getting their land acknowledgement um, approved of and um, solidified with those who are, you know, were affected by it. And so I actually currently don't have a land acknowledgement um, because we have not talked to the, the five Seneca um, nations that we need to talk to in order to get that approved. Um, but Cornell campus does. So that was a big thing they did early on. Um, and they are very good about pushing that. Um, they have got um, what they call the Cornell University and Indigenous Dispossession Project from um, 2020 that was part of the response to the high country news um, report uh, and they are continuing to do studies on um, the impacts on indigenous communities sort of yes thank you <laughs> that is that is yes um, so that's a really good place to look and see um, all of the work that they are doing so I I, I hesitate to speak for them in much detail. Um, Kurt Jordan is our, our contact there, and he is an archaeologist who actually has done several digs in um, near Kananda Saga um, that were approved of and were respectfully conducted um, to see sort of what, to get a better idea of what the population here was prior to um, the uh, dispossession. Um, but we also have, um, Michael, I don't know if, if you were familiar of it when you were here, but um, the Seneca uh, have a site called Ganandigan, which is about 30 minutes west of us, and it tells the story of Sullivan's March and also 
the history, especially the agricultural history of um, the Seneca in our area. And so they, they have sort of indicated to us that their best hope is that we work rather than try to sort of do more at our site is we work with them. There's a white corn project um, where the Seneca are, are um, working to um, continue to commercially produce and spread the use of um, their traditional white corn that Cornell has been active with. Um, and there is another farm, Western New York, um, that's on another Seneca Nation community where they have actively been working with um, our vegetable extension group to find ways to reinvigorate uh, native crops um, to that area. And um, I think their, their plan overall would be to, it's really interesting actually from the point of sustainability as well, is to provide um, a full um, a full food system that respects their native food traditions in that area so that their um, community there could be completely supported by their own farming. So they've recently, for instance, are working on getting a slaughterhouse um, approved for um, for bison and, and that sort of thing. So that's, you know, sustainability is the other big piece that we're, I'm looking at as a director. And so these sort of regional food systems are also quite fascinating, but that's completely other topic. So I'm sorry, that was not a complete answer, Michael. You, no, I appreciate the information. I, I think very much, and I do respect the fact that you're on another campus. And so keeping in touch with what everything that's going on in Ithaca is, is virtually impossible, but I do appreciate the efforts and I'm hopeful that Purdue will begin the conversation that's long needed here. Um, we do have the land acknowledgement, but it's not widely used or even known here on campus and out in the counties. And so we have a lot of work to do. Do you know if the land acknowledgement was developed with the aid of those four nations? Because that's a big question and one that needs to be addressed. Uh, I'm not certain. I know the director of the center and I know they took a lot of care in developing that. Um, we have some challenges here in Indiana. Being from New York, I know that you can go, you can drive through and drive through reservation land and so on. We don't, we don't have any reservations here in Indiana. We do have some critical masses where um, uh, indigenous peoples live and we are connecting with them and so on, but we don't have the uh, tribal councils that we can like reach out to in any kind of boots institutional form to begin those uh, conversations. In fact, we have to go out of state to Michigan to uh, to, wow. to connect with the more formal structure. So it's a, it's a little different here, but um, I think we need to connect more. Uh, we only have about, I think, 80 indigenous students on campus out of a campus of 46,000 people. Wow. Uh, and we don't have a dormitory like we have in a residential setting like we have at Cornell that was founded in 91 that has provided a lot of opportunity for indigenous students to uh, you know, commiserate and get to know one another and celebrate their culture together. Uh, Michael Charles from, he was at Cornell's at now at Ohio State as a grad student shared some of his experience at Cornell and, and being able to uh, live and go to school with, uh, with uh, fellow indigenous students. It was really powerful to hear from him yesterday. Excellent. While people are thinking about the next question, I want to share the survey um, information because we would love to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, Purdue is obviously working with SARE on this, and we're going to have another meeting um, on November 2nd. And so if you want to use this QR code to take it with your phone on your camera, it'll take you to the survey. But we want to hear what your thoughts are so that this helps with our programming. But um, Anna Catherine, when you were saying about sustainability, this is totally on topic because SARE is Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. So you're on topic. <laughs> yes, and I'm seeing more and more. I just, I haven't gotten to read the article yet, but an article just came through the, the Cornell Connect research um, looking at how working with uh, traditional farmers in especially in less developed areas can really help us get a handle on climate change because their observational data goes back a lot further than our instrumental data um, and that can be quite useful so I need to dive into that data too. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you for sharing that. Who would like to ask another question? Um, this is Liz. Uh, since we're on the topic of land acknowledgements, I uh, I wanted to ask. I completely get it. Why um, working in concert with um, indigenous nations would make 
so much sense. Um, lacking the resources to do so, I'm thinking about the small nonprofit that I work for, um, in addition to my farmer hat, um, we recently included a, a very basic land acknowledgement on some signage at the entrance of one of our nature preserves. Cool. Uh, I thought that was a good thing. Maybe I'm thinking now, maybe that was not a good thing since we did not work in concert. Do you have, do you have a sense of like, is it better to not do it all if you don't have a conversation going or, or what the thought is on that? So it's different. I think it depends on who you're representing when you make the statement. So if I put it on my official Cornell email as associate director or even as a professor, I am implicitly representing all of Cornell. And since Cornell has not officially had the discussion with the Seneca Nations yet, we don't want to do that. Um, I think, so if you're, if it's for an organization, that's, that's tough um, because sometimes it is seen as performative. You might want to check out the article that um, I, from Outside Magazine that I dropped in the chat um, because if the intention, I, what's, what is the intention and are you communicating it clearly and is it respectful I guess is the question um, so that it's hard and I am not uh, very I'm not highly trained in cultural competencies with Native American peoples especially with the specific ones in your area so I don't feel really comfortable making a pronouncement on that but um, if you are you know if you're close to Purdue Purdue does have a center so perhaps they could offer guidance um, no, not helpful. <laughs> I'm, I'm really just kind of learning this because we at first were like, oh, all in. Yeah, let's craft a statement that just mirrors the one from, from you know, main campus. And we change the name of the, the um, indigenous tribe and it'll, it'll all be great. And we started asking around and both our experts at Cornell and the, the Seneca folks that we talked to at the museum and Guy, Guy Ananda, again, Ganandigan said, hmm, not so great because we, we have five, five heads of, of the nation now and they all need to be on board to make sure that everyone's okay with what's happening. So it's tough. Okay. Well, thanks. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you for the thought. Liz, um, we're going to have Skylar Cantola will be sharing with us. And I know that um, Skylar is the equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator at Purdue Extension. So that will happen December 2nd. So hopefully you can ask more detailed questions about Purdue maybe. And I know Michael Wilcox is part of that, um, that committee or work. And so I'm glad that they're here joining us. So they're learning along with us. And I appreciate everyone being here. This is not just extension. We have some NRCS people, USDA, a lot of ag professionals um, that Sarah wanted to invite. And um, I appreciate everyone being here. This will be, this is recorded and I'll be sharing this with everyone who registered. And thank you, Anna Catherine, for sharing everything you've learned. This, you've learned a lot the past couple of years <laughs> and I appreciate you sharing that with us so we can learn as well. Well, thank you. And thank you, Michael, for, for contributing your expertise and everyone else who asked questions. It's, it's just constant learning, right? We're not gonna reach the state where we know it all. So developing the network is just as important. I was really pleased to meet Skylar today and, and talk to Michael and yes, we will go forward from there, so. Thank you all and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Take yeah, care. And I just want to remind everyone we're having um, a panel of people in um, November and um, it's people from uh, many different institutions and we really want to make sure everyone comes back to that and then Skylar will be finishing out in December. So thank you all. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.